Why isn't quantitative easing already causing runaway inflation? It is, but it does not yet appear in rising prices. I thought inflation was rising prices. That is a common misunderstanding. Inflation is a growth in the money supply faster than the growth of economic production. But other things can cause a rise or fall of prices. So why did the Bernanke do this quantitative easing? Two reasons. The first was because other countries, especially China, weren't willing to buy treasury bonds to finance the government deficit. So the Federal Reserve just created money out of thin air to do that. What is the second reason? The second reason was to counter the fall in prices of the assets that are collateral for debt, such as mortgaged houses and commercial properties and consumer loans. I thought those falling prices was deflation. Aren't other people calling it deflation? They are wrong to call it deflation. Collateral prices are falling because investors are discovering they don't have the value the lenders expected they would have when they made the loans. So the Bernanke is doing a targeted inflation of the collateral. You got it. But the inflationary effect can't be confined to the collateral. It will spill over into other things, starting with the government services and benefits for which the quantitative easing was primarily needed to fund. It is for paying government workers and vendors and paying benefits. Wouldn't that cause rising prices in other sectors? Yes, but not necessarily immediately. The inflationary effects of creating more money is buffered by the dependence of the currencies of almost every nation on the U.S. dollar as their reserve currency. How does the U.S. dollar being the world's reserve currency work? Banks once backed their bank notes or credit entries, which is what national currencies now are, with gold or silver, which could not be created out of thin air. Now they back them with U.S. dollars. So what are U.S. dollars backed by? The full faith and credit of the United States. What does that mean? That the U.S. government promises to hold down growth of the money supply to about the rate of growth of the economy by taxation or borrowing to offset the amounts it creates to fund its operations and benefits. Doesn't quantitative easing break that promise? Yes, it does. Which is why other countries are looking for ways to stop using the U.S. dollar as their reserve currency. What is stopping them? They don't have any good alternatives. There is not enough gold or silver in the world to go back to precious metals. Some have suggested backing currencies with units of energy, as petroleum now partly backs the U.S. dollar because petroleum is traded in U.S. dollars. So why don't they go to energy-backed currencies? That may be the subject of another video. For the moment understand that the inflationary effect of quantitative easing is being absorbed by the currencies of the world that are based on the U.S. dollar as their reserve currency. In effect, it is inflating all of them at once. How is that a bad thing? It has some advantages. It acts as a kind of tax on the nations of the world to pay for the services of the U.S. as the world's policemen, securing things like the delivery of oil on which they all depend. What else does it mean? It will all reduce consumption of non-governmental services everywhere, especially in the U.S., and adversely impact private sector jobs that supply such consumption. Ultimately, it will bring a collapse of governmental services as well. What will be the signs of collapse? Other countries abandoning the U.S. dollar. Since they have nowhere else to go, that will mean a collapse of all national currencies at about the same time. So what will that mean? We will all have to revert to barter of basic commodities and direct services. Perhaps trade in private digital certificates for goods and services instead of government currencies. Most production and distribution beyond localities will become severely reduced. Cities will become ghost towns. Millions will starve. You've got to be shitting me. Most countries will probably have to declare martial law and use force to command people to do things they can't pay them to do. But there are limits even to martial law. Some may be tempted to start wars to control their people. I didn't realize the threat was so great. Most people are in denial. They have a normalcy bias and prefer to believe it can't get that bad here. They don't want to pay the real costs of all the benefits we are paying ourselves. Has this ever happened before? Yes. 
in places like Yugoslavia, before it broke up, Argentina, Zimbabwe, Weimar Germany. There are parallels to the breakup of the Soviet Union and to the disasters in Cambodia, Rwanda, and Somalia. But those were confined to one country at a time. If it happens everywhere at once we will have a situation worse than the Great Depression. What can any of us do? We need to drastically reduce our consumption, especially of government benefits and services, such as Social Security, Medicare, Medicaid, farm subsidies, and public works, that don't contribute directly to production. What about raising taxes? A tax of 100% of everything we have and earn would not be enough. You've got to be shitting me. So how much do we need to reduce government benefits? We need to totally eliminate them. At this point it is too late to just reduce them or phase them out. Oh my god. What will we do with the elderly and sick? The same thing we did before we had all those programs. The same thing other countries, like China, do that they don't have them. Private charity. That seems heartless. The universe is heartless. There are limits to what we can do for others, no matter how much we may want to help them. Ultimately it all comes down to human psychology. Not that we can think our way out of the laws of economics, but by keeping cool, helping one another, and making wiser choices going forward, we can get through this. Perhaps not all of us. A lot of people, the elderly, the sick, the weak, are probably not going to make it. But hopefully we will learn from this and not make the same mistakes, at least for another couple of generations, until people forget again. What about laws and institutions? In the US we need to get back to the Constitution as originally meant. If we had stuck to it, and other countries had stuck to constitutions like ours originally, specifying minimal governmental powers, we wouldn't be in this situation today. We need to adopt some clarifying amendments to overturn 200 years of bad court decisions.